So we've been in this series for the last couple of weeks entitled From Pain to Freedom, where we've been talking about really how to get unstuck from some of the stuff that, that holds us in there, those habits, those hurts, those, those just kind of ways of doing things that keep complicating our life. It's kind of all revolved around sin, right? But it's, it just keeps us in that stuck place. And I was thinking the other day, you know, one of the struggles of doing a series like this or even a, a sermon like we're going to do today is realize we come in here to this place and we come from, I don't know, the world, right? We were coming from getting ready this morning. I was just talking about fantasy football before we went in here. Another one of my guys is injured and, and you know, it, it's just all that kind of different stuff. And, you know, you start thinking about, you know, your, my daughter's in California and she was swimming yesterday in the ocean. She got a black eye because somebody kicked her in the face. And I was, I was thinking about that and it's just all sorts of stuff, just life, right? Just life as it comes and you walk in these doors and, and boom, okay, you know, I've got to pay attention, Right. And it's hard. And so we do the music at the beginning to kind of center you. That's what the music's for, to, to bring us God's word in, 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 in tune, right? And so that it can kind of settle us and focus us on who our amazing God is and how much he loves us and all that kind of stuff. And, and then we go through that time that, you know, we do that confession and absolution. We take some silence to confess to him our stuff, to get rid of it, to, because that's probably banging around in our head too. And we just want to get rid of it and be forgiven so that we can focus in on God's word. And yet, even with all that, it's hard, I think, just coming in and in the space of 15 minutes, getting to a place where you can be vulnerable and, and hear God's word anew. And it's not just these sermons, it's really any sermon, but, but getting to a place where you can kind of look at yourself and say, man, I do need forgiveness, or I do need help, or I, do, I am stuck in this area, and man, that 10 seconds of, of silence just doesn't seem to be enough to unpack everything. But we've been in this series, and we're looking specifically at how do we get unstuck from some of the stuff that just, I don't know, keeps us from moving forward. And so last week we looked at stuff, and we've been looking at the word recovery as we've been going through this, and we've been taking a letter from that word each time, and it kind of symbolizes one of the eight steps that you go through as you go through recovery. And today we're going to take a look at, you know, that O step of recovery. But just kind of as a review, you know, we, we went and we realized that, you know, it's not enough just to know that I've got problems. That was step one, right? And it's not enough just to know that God can solve them. That was sort of step two. But step three was I must consciously turn them over to him. It's not just, it's, so it's our faith is more than just knowing about God and knowing that he's amazing. It's actually getting to that trust step. It's actually trusting him with the more, trusting that he's got us, trusting that we can be forgiven. It's making commitment of my life and my will to say, God, I'm yours, I will follow you, I will trust you, I will lean on you, I will do it your way. I give you everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So God begins to take those problems when we do stuff like that and he begins to work on us and he begins to free us from stuff and he begins to cleanse us and he begins to, to give us peace as we go through life and it's amazing. And so we build on that today with step four and it's kind of giving God some actual tangible stuff to really work on, I guess, but it call it the house cleaning step. And it has to do with cleaning up the past, letting go of the guilt, Gaining a clear conscience so that we can live guilt-free. I mean, ultimately, that's what Jesus came for, wasn't it? To say, I forgive you of your sins so that you don't have to walk around beating yourself up anymore. I know we do this crazy thing, and it's not just a Catholic church thing. It's a Lutheran church thing, right? Where we keep beating ourselves up for the past, and we think it's holy. It's not. It's not receiving the forgiveness of God. You know what should be the mark of a Christian? Living guilt-free. Receiving that forgiveness of God. Gaining the strength to do it differently in the future. Being that work in progress that says that I've got you, I'll be with you, I'll get you through. And so we're going to take a look at this step this morning because this is a powerful step. This is really one that releases us to let us to move forward. And if you do this step with me today, I promise you next week you're going to feel a whole lot better at this time. So anyway, we're taking a look at the O. O stands for openly examine and confess my faults to God, to myself, and to someone I trust. So you start asking, well, why is this part of the recovery process? And it's because guilt just has this way of keeping us stuck. I don't know what it is that you prayed during that 10 seconds. Hopefully your mind wasn't blank, right? But I don't know what it is that you prayed. But some of that stuff fills us with shame. And we feel that in the middle of the night when we wake up and all of a sudden we're just beaten down by the stuff that we can't change in the past, but we did. And we know it's complicating relationships and we just don't know what to do. Sometimes it's fear that somebody's going to find out the stuff that we did and it terrorizes us and... And sometimes it's just, we just don't let go of that hurt. And it colors every relationship we have going forward. Have you ever heard somebody says, I struggle trusting people? Why? Because they've been hurt in the past and they can't forgive it and they can't let go of it. And it's just, it messes everything up. 
Guilt just keeps us stuck in the past. Guilt keeps us from growing and becoming all that God wants us to be, right? Living the life that he wants us to live. And so if we're really going to learn to enjoy life and live that guilt-free life, which is the good news, right, which is why Jesus came, you've got to learn how to get rid of this guilt thing. Because the truth is, none of us in here is faultless. We all have sins. We've all made mistakes. We all have regrets. We all have remorse. There's all things that we wish we could turn back the clock on, go back to that time and say, man, I wish we would have done this different. But we didn't. So we feel bad about it. We feel guilty about it. And we've been carrying it with us for I don't know how many years. As a result of that, we carry around this guilt, sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously. And there's a lot of ways that this messes with our life, right? It makes us feel bad about things and keeps us looking back instead of forward. We may deny this guilt. We may repress it. We may blame other people for the guilt. We may excuse the guilt. We may rationalize the guilt. But man, we still feel the effects of it. And so if you're ever going to recover from your hurts, if you're going to get off stuck, right, from these habits and these hang-ups and these hurts that you've got in your life, you've got to let go of the guilt so that you can begin living again. But maybe the question is how, right? There was this guy, and I remember this because I was in college and it made me mad, right? So that's why I remember this example. But I was sitting there and I was listening to one of those talk show radio guys, right? That was a psychologist, or at least a purported psychologist, and people were calling into the radio. If you remember, if you're older like me, Dr. Fraser Crane, right? Had a whole TV series on this kind of stuff. So it was a big back of the day. Anyway, these people would call in, they're a mess, and they just wanted to get some advice, right? It was free. So this one guy called in and he says, I am consumed with guilt, I can't breathe, I can't move forward, I, I, I can't let my past go, I can't forgive myself, I, it's ruining my life, I, I can't eat right, it's ruining my relationships, I keep, I keep sinking and I don't know what to do. How do I get rid of my guilt? And the guy on the radio said, oh, you can't. You just have to learn to live with it. That was his great advice. As a believer, I, I, I'm like screaming at the radio at this point because I'm just like, what are, what are you talking about? You can't get rid of the guilt. There is forgiveness. You don't have to live with this for the rest of your life. There is a new beginning, a fresh start that Jesus gives us. You don't have to be bonded and in bondage to that past for the rest of your life. But this guy on the radio just didn't give him that hope. When I heard it, I was like, give me this guy's number. I'll call him. I'll tell him. You know, you know those kind of things. But the truth is, because of Jesus, right, we don't have to live with guilt anymore. That's the gospel. That's the good news. There's a way to get rid of it once and for all. There's a way to live without all that pain. But again, you start asking, well, how, how do we do that? How do we get rid of the guilt? And the Bible is wonderful in so many ways, but it gives us these four things, right? These, this is the process, and it's important. And we're going to break it down, you know, a little bit more than you guys probably do. But, but if you go through this process, especially as intentionally as we're going to talk about it today, man, it makes a difference. It has an effect. I can't tell many times, I, I, I've kind of shared this in messages, but if you are just stressed, one of the most helpful things you can do is just go to God and, and confess to him. God, I'm sorry, and receive that forgiveness. God, I, can't, I don't know what to do with this. I'm freaking out, and give that to him. Give him your worries, give him your sins, give him your stress, give him your anxieties, all things which are not trusting him, and thus are sin. Give it all to him, and be renewed, and be freed, and be at peace. It works. It's amazing. It's why I keep saying you should confess 10 sins a day just to get rid of that stuff so that you're not carrying it all around all the time. But we start going through these steps, and step one is just this. It's take a moral personal moral inventory. And you don't have to do it this specific, but I mean, if you do, it's, it's really powerful. But what that means is that you get alone by yourself. Maybe you get a pencil and a piece of paper and you sit down and you say, God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> what do I have to feel guilty about? What have I regretted? What have I been feeling remorseful about lately? What keeps waking me up in the middle of the night? What are the faults that I know I need changing? Some of these came to your mind in those 10 seconds, right? When we were confessing. And then you ask God to help you out and bring these things to your mind. In Psalm 139, 23, and 24, that's what the psalmist was doing. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Point out anything you find in me that makes you sad. It's like you're sitting there and you say, Lord, okay, I'm here. I'm ready. You know, I got my pencil and paper. Just start bringing them to me. And again, one of the beautiful things about that repentance things is it's like, if you can imagine this backpack that you've been carrying around with all that shame and all that guilt and all that fear and all that anxiety and all that worry and how it loads you down and how it wearies you. It's like taking out those rocks one by one and just getting rid of them and you don't have to take them back, right? It's just getting rid of this one and all of a sudden it's lighter and you get rid of this one and all of a sudden it's lighter. It's where you take a moral inventory 
And when you do this, you need to take some time, just let it play out. Truth is, I've done this a lot of times in my life, and it's become a regular habit, a discipline that keeps me in tune, growing and healthy, and certainly something that gets rid of my stress. But it doesn't work unless you're ruthlessly honest with yourself, where you say, I'm going to be dead honest about all this stuff, Lord. I'm going to quit pretending. I'm going to quit denying. I just, I'm going to lay out what's wrong with my life. I'm going to write it down right here, you know, and and if you ever need help with this, go through the Ten Commandments, the way that Jesus talked about them, right? It's, I've never gotten through all ten, to be honest. It, it, usually I don't even get past the fourth one, where it's honor your mother and father, and all of a sudden I spiral, right? I'm, I'm a horrible son, and I'm a horrible dad, and I'm a horrible pastor, and I'm a, you know, a, a horrible friend, and there's all these things that I fall short on and wish I did better, and there's all these things that I do that are just sinful and wrong and unhelpful, and I never even get past that one, and there's a whole load in the next six, you know, and I just... But the truth is where you get real with stuff. But after you've done that, that's just the first part of repentance. You've got to go to the second part where you're, <laughs> and this is a little countercultural, but you have to accept responsibility for your faults. In Proverbs 20, verse 27, it says, the Lord gave us a mind and a conscience we cannot hide from ourselves. He's just saying that the greatest holdup to healing in my life, and at least healing from my issues, is me. And the greatest holdup to solving and resolving the hangups in your life is you. And so step two starts with being radically honest and saying, <laughs> I'm the problem. And this is hard for our culture today because everything in our culture encourages you to blame somebody else for your problems, to not take ownership over them, to blame somebody, anybody else, so that you don't have to change. But the truth is, we alone control our responses in life. We alone will have to give an account to God when we die for everything we've said, for everything we've done. We don't get to blame anybody else before God. That's kind of crazy, and he knows everything. And so we admit what we already know, that we're the biggest obstacle to getting better. But if we keep saying stuff like this, I just need to change stuff. I just need to change my relationships or my job. I just need to change towns. I just need to change locations. If we just think it's an external thing, I'm telling you, we're going to keep ourselves from actually dealing with the actual problems which is me. You see, the only problem with changing all your externals is, is that wherever you go and wherever you end up, you're still there and you keep messing stuff up. So step two is you accept responsibility for your faults. You don't rationalize them and say it happened a long time ago or it was just a stage or everybody else was doing it. You don't rationalize it, minimize it. You don't say it's no big deal. Let's look at that one for a sec. And I say that because if it's no big deal, then how come you're still remembering it 20 years later? But you do. So you don't minimize it. You don't blame others. You don't say it's mostly their fault because, well, it may be mostly their fault, but it's still 10% your fault. And it may be mostly your fault, but you still got your part. And it may be mostly their fault, but why are you still allowing it to affect your life today, days, weeks, months, years later? So we need to get to a place where we own our part where we admit that we've messed up, or we've sinned, right? And that's, remember what John says in 1 John, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Philip's translation says we will live in a world of illusion, or, or the living Bible says we're only fooling ourselves. But the point is, if I want to stop defeating myself, I have to stop deceiving myself and pretending that everything's everybody else's fault. When the issue mostly and almost entirely is just me. So let me just ask you with that, what are you pretending to not feel guilty about, but your heart still knows it's there and it's still bothering you? And I'll just ask if you can think of something, then don't you think it's about time to get over it, to finally get on with your life and leave that in the past? So what do you do? You make a moral inventory, right? You write it all down, you make the list, and then you say, yeah, that list, that's, that's me. I accept responsibility for my faults. But then you got to go to God and got to go to God and say, God, forgive me. I mean, you ask God for forgiveness. In 1 John 1 9, it says this crazy thing. He says, If we freely admit that we have sinned, we will find God utterly reliable. He forgives our sins and makes us thoroughly clean from all that is evil. Do you get that? If we freely admit it, God will forgive us. So you start asking, well, how do we ask for forgiveness in the right way? Well, you don't do it through begging, and you don't do it through bargaining, and you don't do it through bribing. Those generally don't work out too well. Jesus says, believe me. And isn't that the struggle when we ask God to forgive us for the same thing more than once? God forgave us the first time. You know that, right? You guys, God forgive me. He says, cool, because Jesus, you're forgiven. 
fact that we asked again is because we didn't trust it. What we did was so horrible in our eyes, we feel like we're still beating ourselves up. We need to pay for it a little bit more, and we just couldn't trust it. We couldn't let it go. But Jesus just says, I just need you to believe. Just trust that it's there for you. It's there. It's yours. Believe that I will actually give you forgiveness, and it's yours. That's what the Bible says again. If we freely admit that we've sinned, we find God utterly reliable. He forgives our sin and makes us thoroughly clean from all that is evil. So he says, admit it. Admit it is actually a Greek word that we get the word confess from. To admit or confess means to speak the same thing about the stuff on your list that God says about it. Say, God, I was wrong, you were right, and I'm so sorry about it. That's it. That's what it means to confess, to say, God, you're right, I'm wrong, and I'm super sorry. I didn't mean to do it. I I messed up again. And then notice this. The basis of your forgiveness is because he's utterly reliable. It's based on God's nature, not your nature. Praise be to God for that, because I'm a mess. It's based on what Jesus did, not on what you've done. But you say, Pastor, you don't know. If, if, I, if I make this list, you don't know what's on it. It's brutal. I, there's stuff that nobody should ever be forgiven for that's on this list. And I know you, probably some of you are thinking that because people have told me that. But I tell you, that's where you're wrong. That's where you're in error. That's where you go against what the Bible says, Right? Truth is, as a pastor, I've just heard stuff, right, over the years. Nothing surprises me anymore. There's not too much left. And what I've learned from all that experience is this, and I can tell you this with 100% truth, that every time I've led people through this step and they've received the forgiveness of God in their life, I've watched change happen in their life. I've watched people start again. I, I watch people experience this amazing peace. I, I've watched parents, people just be able to leave the past and sleep again. Sleep. Just sleep for the first time in years. I've watched them be able to start relationships unencumbered by that past junk that kept complicating every relationship they had up to that point. I've watched God do amazing things. And here's the thing. Every single time, there is no sin that is too bad that God can't forgive. That's why we call it good news, man. Because he can forgive the wretch that sometimes is us. There was a woman, not at our church, but at my buddy's church. He's a pastor, and she came to him one day, and she was sharing the story. She was just saying, I'm depressed. I can't get out of bed in the morning. I don't even have the will or desire to keep living. It's bad. I just, I want to give up in every single way. And, and as she was talking, he began to notice something, and so he just asked her, he says, there's is there something that you're holding on to that you regret? Is there some sin that you've left unconfessed even to God? Is there something that's just in there that you just won't let go of? And she just started crying. She said, yeah. That's where she shared this story that her husband traveled a lot in his job. And one of those travels she had had an affair, gotten pregnant, had an abortion, and never told him about it. My friend then explained to her that Jesus Christ said, I can forgive and I can cleanse you of every sin. But she said, it's not fair, right? I mean, somebody's got to pay for what I did. What I did was horrible. There's no no way that he can forgive this. Somebody's got to pay. And then my buddy said, somebody did, and his name's Jesus Christ. If you know the gospel, you know that's why he had to die on the cross in such a brutal way. That's why he had to descend into hell for three days before he could rise again. He had to face the full penalty of our sin in all of its weight. But he died so that every sin that she confessed and would confess and would ever do could be forgiven. He died so that every sin that you've confessed and will confess and ever will do will be forgiven. So we humbly we come to God knowing that he's amazing in this way and we say, God, forgive me. And Isaiah 118, he says, no matter how deep the stain of your sin, I can take it out. I can make it as clean as freshly fallen snow. And I kind of like that as my soap bar verse, right? You keep hearing about detergents getting all the stains out of stuff. And, but God says, no matter what the stain is, I can take it out. And that's where we experience the peace and that's where we experience the healing. But there's still one more step. And I give you this because sometimes we still ask that second time for forgiveness. We've got to receive, or I'll use the word trust again. Trust that God's forgiveness is for us. And forgive ourselves. In Romans 3, 23 and 24, it says all of us have sinned, all. Some of you are maybe feeling a little lonely right now. Pastor's talking right to me. I don't know how he knew, but this message is right for me today and it's freaking me out. But the truth is, it doesn't, right? I write these six weeks in advance. I mean, it wasn't for you, but 
It seems like every week I find somebody that comes up to me and says, you read my thoughts again today, Pastor. And I just want to say, no, no, I'm reading mine. I'm a mess, right? We're all in the same boat. Pastors need to take step four, two, all the time. I need to get rid of that guilt. I need to get rid of that shame. I need to get rid of that worry. I need to get rid of that anxiety. I need to give it to God because I'm not trusting. We're all in the same boat. We're just a bunch of sinners, man. Nobody's more righteous than anybody else because we're all broken before God. We all need his forgiveness. It's not like anybody's more righteous than anybody else. We just got different problems in different areas. That's why Paul writes, all have sinned. And then he writes this, yet God declares us not guilty. If we trust in Christ, who freely takes away our sins. My prayer this morning is that you let God do just that. That you let him unbondage you from whatever it is that you're holding on to. That you let him finally free you from those past memories, from those past hurts, from those past circumstances that keep you from finally loving somebody, that keep you from finally moving forward and trusting somebody, that keep you from finally moving forward and just living life. I want him to free you from that shame. I want him to free you from that fear. I want him to free you so that you don't have to live in that bondage anymore. I want him to give you that new life. I mean, that's why they call it the gospel. That's why they call it good news, because it's life-changing. Because it gives us the strength to finally move forward without all that garbage and be free. At peace. Living in hope because we have a God that can do anything. So that's my prayer this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said... Amen. Let me pray. God, we love you so much. You know, as we go through this series, it's, it can be challenging, especially if we start giving you stuff, if we start pondering through these areas that we are stuck. And, and each week, it's, it seems like we're breaking it down awful far, but it's each week, it's, God, we got to give stuff to you. And then we got to trust you with the stuff we give to you so that we don't take it back. And Father, if we do that, there is a tangible peace and a freedom on the other side of this. There is a strength to move past these habits that keep complicating our lives. There is a way to move past our past that keeps haunting us. There is a way to be free. Father, I pray more and more, even as we come to the altar today and receive communion, that we can just leave all that stuff here at the foot of the cross and in a tangible way just leave it here and walk away free, encouraged and strengthened to live a life that you have for us and to live a life of joy and freedom and peace. And that's my prayer today. We pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.